Hey, it's Pete, and I'm here to talk about the book Erasure by Percival Everett, which I did on audiobook. Let me get to my notes here. I actually have notes because this is the first book that I listened to after I decided to do a channel, so I made notes, which I probably won't do in the future, but I thought it'd be a good idea. And now I have to look at my notes because I knew I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to discuss, oh my goodness, where are they, I uh, originally decided I was going to read it, what happened was I <clears throat> read a review of the movie, it's the movie American Fiction is based on this novel by Percival Everett, and I read a review, a very positive review of the movie which said the book is even better, so I thought, oh that'll be fun, I'll, I'll read the book first because I hadn't seen the movie yet, and then I will watch the movie and then I will do a video about both. But now I've decided, and this is not a reflection of the book, I, I really like the book a lot. Spoiler alert, I love the book, otherwise I wouldn't do the video, at least at this point. And I just felt like, I don't want to watch the movie right now. I'm not into seeing movies these days because I, I have a lot to read and I'm enjoying reading more, so I'm just going to treat the book on its own. First thing I want to discuss before I get into the book itself is the fact that I, re I listened to the audiobook of it because that was available at the library first. I didn't really have a preference. I just wanted to get it before I had a chance to watch the movie, which I said I didn't do. And I'm glad I picked the audiobook, though, because the narrator named Sean Christen does an excellent job with this book. It's, he's a very good narrator. And I'm going to do a video at some point on audiobook narrators because it makes a difference to me if. If the narrator is no good, I will stop reading. I will stop listening to the book, no matter what. And this is a very good reader with a very difficult job. I think the, the Mr. Chris, Kristen works as an actor and does a lot of voiceover in in um, video games, which games that probably people have heard of if they look up his name. But you know, I don't know about games, so. Uh, and the book has a lot of different registers of voices in it, uh, for a reason I'll get to in a second. And he handled those really well. So it's an excellent performance, and not in that kind of showy, stagey way that too many narrators do these days, where they do like very specific voice characterizations of every single character. And, and the more characters in the book, the more and more bizarre and outre get the different voice characterizations get. So I really enjoyed that. Now on to the Percival Everett's book, Erasure itself. This book is 20 years old. Uh, it seems very contemporary though. I'm sure the, I wonder, now I wonder if I should see the movie. I wonder if the movie is set uh, 20 years ago. So this is right around, uh, I think it, I think the, the time of the novel is probably around 95, 97. It was published around 2000. Uh, a nice surprise of the book, I didn't know this going in, is I just happen to be, a, I guess you could say I like bargains, I happen to be a sucker for a book within a book. I think it's a very clever and always enjoyable to me so far way of writing a book about a writer is to see a lot of their own writing. You know, there's a book, uh, there's a couple of mysteries by Anthony Horowitz that are done this way, the Magpie Murders and Moonflower Murders, where you know, the character sits down, they start reading this book, then there's a mystery involved in the book. This is different, of course, because this is more ambitious. The Basically, the premise people probably know, because if this movie's out with Jeffrey Wright, it's about a writer, a black writer, uh, African-American literary writer, who is struggling with his place in the literary landscape in that he's writing the books he wants to write. He doesn't write on what are quote-unquote black subjects or African-American subjects. He just writes the novels he wants to write based on his background, which is a upper middle class background. His father's a doctor. His, both his siblings are doctors. And he's kind of the baby of the family. Where, you know, and he's a little bit uh, spoiled or idealized by his family. You know, not his sister who's a little bit jealous of him. Uh, just as the artist in the family. So... He's got this going on. He's a single guy. He's quite a bit younger than Jeffrey Wright. I would think. I would say he's probably around thirty-five or so in the book. 
and he's he's got this kind of nagging thing in his his life. There's a there's a writer out at the time the book takes place. There's a very um, prominent book by an African American woman writer who who's a writer that happened to go to Oberlin, but she writes this real ghetto book, and it, you know and people are praising it, and he feels like it's very cliche and pandering, and he's resentful. So this is causing him some stress, and but he has a really good life other than that. He's got a nice teaching job in California. He's, he's, he's single, so he doesn't have a lot of demands on his time. And so it's kind of like a nagging thing. But then there's some changes. I won't go into the plot. of There's some changes in his family circumstances where money would be more important. So then this kind of nagging thing about how he's not getting his due as a writer really starts to grind on him. He And then this is where the book within a book part comes in. I don't know how they're going to handle this in the movie, if they really do this, but you get the whole book that he writes basically for money in this other voice, in this very cynically done uh, book that he writes, which is about uh, 100 pages long within the text of this three years. 100 page novel, 300 page novel, or whatever. And it's very witty. And the writing, part, now I'm going to go back to before I discuss, the character's name is Monk. It's his, that's his nickname. His full name is uh, Thelonious Monk Ellison. Thelonious Ellison. So you can write right away there, you can kind of see the pedigree that the Percival Everett is trying to to go for name, giving him the same last name as Ralph Ellison and you know implying that his parents were very like artistic and sophisticated by naming their son after Thelonious Monk the jazz musician and Percival Everett the writer as opposed to the character writer does, is very, structures this book in a very interesting way really enjoyable for me. If you like books about academia and you like books about, uh, you know, very intelligent intellectuals and, and things like that, you'll like this because Everett goes to great, this is a first person narrator, but Everett goes to great lengths to show us uh, one, the, the sort of cynical voice of Monk, the writer who's telling his own story, and little, and little, various techniques Everett uses to show us that Monk, the character, is really a great writer. He, you know, he has been going about his life, telling his family story and all that, but also we see sides, like for example, he's going for a job, at one point a teaching job, when he has to move closer to his family, and, he's, and we're given his entire CV, his entire resume, which shows these push card prizes he's won, and you know all these these other awards, and and which is kind of separate from him just telling us he's a good writer, uh, that he's an ambitious writer. He really is. Everything he says, he is, and we don't have to take just the narrator's uh, own ego for it. Uh, he also does a thing with um, Monk's two hobbies. He'll have these little sides about Monk's passion for fishing and his passion for woodworking. And the woodworking sections sort of give the reader, at least me as the reader, a real feeling for how serious Monk takes his craft, takes the craft of writing, because he takes the same care in woodworking. And fishing kind of gives more of a metaphor about Monk's attitude towards trying to sell himself as a writer, trying to market himself, trying to uh, get a reputation just by, by waiting and being careful and listening. And, and so I thought all that stuff was really cool. There's, it, the book is also very funny. Uh, if you like parodies of academia and that kind of thing, it's all a very funny episodes like early on he gives a, this paper this this sort of paper on a semiotic su subject which is just so overwrought and hilarious and you get the, the impression that he really is only giving this writings paper giving this paper on half because he enjoys like tweaking the academy and the pre pretentiousness of people in the academy and there's some like rivalries and some sort, sort of silly sort of nonsense that goes on 
between like overly intellectualized people and on the other hand he's, he's probably just he's probably wrote this because he's, he's very good he can write in a bunch of different modes and he wanted the, the expenses paid so he could go home on this trip and visit his, his mom and his sister um, so I enjoyed all that I think it's a really masterfully put together book uh, what happens in the book, you know, it's kind of been spoiled because, you know, the movie's out there and stuff. Um, he he writes a book, Monk writes this book, as I said before, that is just a commercial, just a hack job. In his mind, it's a hack job. And something very interesting about that, and I don't know, I may be on sh um, shaky ground here, so if I'm offending people or if I'm misreading this I'm sorry but this is just how it struck me even in the hack uh, novel the, the cliche ghetto novel that he that he writes and he and he makes up his own uh, he makes up a persona to go along with it there's still some very good writing in that that manuscript that he puts out there and and that he tries to pass off as be written by uh, authentic street guy who's been on the streets and you know ripped from the from the authentic uh, po life of poverty and but there's sentences in there that are still really poetic there's a little passage in there where the character in the book that Monk writes which is in the book that Percival Everett the author of the novel wrote is this character the per first person characters so talking about how I you know, talking about his own mother and his passage about, I hate my mother, I love my mother, and just going back and forth. And it's interesting that the character has, the character in the novel within a novel has a mother kind of issue going on because Monk has one too because of things that happen in the book. So even when a writer, a good writer, like Monk is presented as and is shown to be in this book, even when they're doing the, the worst thing, thing they can do, the most cynically produced thing, they still can't help but be good in a certain way. So that 100-page book is very compelling to read, even though it's trash, even though the author, Monk, hates the idea, would never put his name on it, just despises it. In a way, it kind of reminds me of... of, of the book reminds me of a few things that have happened in, in real life. Like uh, I guess the most famous one that brought to mind was the J.T. Leroy story, which if people don't know, it was a middle class, uh, which was a, a, a woman who wrote uh, a novel in the persona of a runaway uh, teenager boy who, who became a street prostitute, and it was, you know, written as a memoir or a novel, I can't remember it. It was all made up, and the woman who wrote it and her husband, they eventually hired an actress to, yeah, I think an actress to play J.T. Leroy and go on, uh, go on appearances and stuff, uh, you know, because there's that thing in publishing where they want to, the publisher was looking for this real authentic thing, but they, they also have to have a person who can really write the book, so Monk kind of goes on his own journey that way, he doesn't hire an actor or anything like that. He goes on shows and he he projects this persona and he intimidates a lot of uh, uh, white people, like establishment tastemakers and stuff, the editor and stuff who don't want to call him on stuff, and it's it's very biting satire on the media landscape and the book club book promotion landscape too. So you could just tell it was just very fun to write. It's very fun to read. And, uh, and I think it kind of reminded me, like the character in the book kind of reminded me like of Trevanian, the thriller writer who wrote The Iger Sanction and, and The Loose Sanction and, and uh, I can't say the name of it, but another assassin novel. He wrote a book called The Main, which was a police novel in the, in the, in the vein of Joseph Wamba, then he wrote some other different genres. He, the story always goes around, I don't know if he said this in interviews or not, that he wrote 
the Iger Sanctions first book because he thought that the and he was a, he was an academic and he thought that the James Bond novels were just so obnoxious and stupid and that, and they were just so bad and that he would write one even worse and he called his character his main character Jonathan Hemlock and he was a this writer Trevani is a pseudonym for a professor of uh, professor of arts the art history I believe and so he wrote this book. Jonathan Hemlock, the assassin, he, and he, he also had a pal passion for mountain climbing, so he put that in the book. And he wrote this book that was supposed to be dreadful for money, and it was a big, big hit. And then he got so mad that it was a hit that he wrote a second one called The Lou Sanction. Lou is in the British slang for toilet, and he had the, the, the sanction, which is a word for murder, assassination, appear in a toilet, and he just, just hated the whole genre and everything. And, but in part of my mind, I have to wonder how serious all that was, and if there wasn't a part of him that really liked James Bond and really responded to these books, or otherwise, how could he have written um, them so well? Because they are good books. All, all Toronian's books are worth reading, and he kept, after those first two uh, assassinate, uh, assassin books, he never wrote any more Jonathan Hemlock books. He wrote other books in other genres, and... Summer of Kotch is a really good one. He wrote six or seven books. He just could not fail as a writer. He just kept writing books that became bestsellers and, and uh, under this pseudonym Trevanian. And so something similar happens to Monk in this book. Uh, it ends kind of on an ambiguous note. Oh, that wasn't too much of a spoiler, but who cares? I mean, I heard the other day that there's a there's there's this, uh, there's this Brandon Sanderson lecture on YouTube where he cites some study that they they did where they discovered that people actually enjoy movies that have been spoiled after they watch before they watch it then then they do just going in cold for example you know I guess they would show the trailer I guess they would you know take two groups of people and they would tell one the story and then they would have another group and just go in cold and then the people who had already had the story told to them seem to enjoy it more. This also happens in um, film comedies where some filmmakers used to get upset that on trailer cutters, on producers, because they would, they would release, they would put all the jokes, the best jokes in the trailers and like why are you ruining that for everybody? And Producers would claim that, you know, no, because when people see the jokes in the trailer and then they see them again in the movie, they laugh harder. So it's kind of odd. I don't know if you can really prove this or not, but anyway, I just saw that information the other day. So I would recommend Percival Everett's uh, book, Erasure which has turned into a movie American fiction, fiction, which is probably a more com much more commercial title, Eraser, and that horrible cover I told I showed you at the beginning is, you know, it's, sometimes you wonder if these publishers even care anymore when they put out titles, uh, covers like that, you know, okay, it's a, a book with a book cover on the title, if I can find it again. Um, so I might probably, honestly, probably wouldn't have read it if I didn't uh, read that a few review of the movie, which claimed the book was even better, but I really think there's a lot of value in it, especially if you like, you know, different takes on topical cultural issues related to publishing and that kind of thing, and he's obviously a very good writer, he's written many books, I'll probably read others at some time, I think that's long enough, and we'll talk again, thank you.